saw my little posting on Facebook last night. <coughs> this is uh, one of these messages that um, I've never preached a sermon quite like this in my life. And uh, this isn't one of those you necessarily go looking for. It kind of comes looking for you. My message today, and I will just tell you too, this is my official disclaimer here before the message. You know, if, uh, if you've got a kid you don't think is old enough to hear this, I don't know what to say. It's, you're the parent, it's up to your discretion. Uh, I'm not going to be rated R, but I am going to be PG-13. And uh, the title of my message today is, Thou Shalt Not Commit Adultery. Uh, open with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to read the Ten Commandments this morning. Now, we're going to read all the way from verse 1 through verse 21. I don't want to just pull that one verse out. I want you to get the real context. This is Moses up on the mountain, okay? God speaks to him, and understand when it was all said and done, God had given Moses 613 commands, but these were the big ten, okay? Exodus chapter 20, starting at verse 1, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or above or on the earth, or beneath, or in the waters below, and you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generations of those that hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but in the seventh Day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor manservant nor maidservant, nor any animal nor alien within your gates. For the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day, and therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother so that, it may, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor maidservant, nor ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen to you, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Verse 21, And the people remained at his distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we uh, look at a powerful passage of Scripture here this morning, God, where you came down and spoke to man, Lord, and God, you spoke with such clarity and such authority, God, that the people actually said, don't let God speak to us unless we die. When you spoke these Ten Commands, you, you opened up their hearts, God, and you revealed, God, what was going on on the inside of their God, and they knew that they stood condemned before you. God, we pray that this moment, God, would be a time, God, when we understand, yes, that we are sinners and that we have sinned before you, but God, help us to walk away from here this morning, Lord, knowing and understanding, God, that there is redemption and there is forgiveness in your Son. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you today about the seventh commandment. You know, in case you've, it's never really clicked, you might have clicked there for the first time. When you read the Ten Commandments, there are five of them that God gives some explanation or some commentary on, and there's five others that he does not. Did you kind of notice that? You know, example, the fourth commandment there in verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? That's pretty simple and straightforward, right? 
But you know what he does? He goes on to give, I counted them out in my office the other night, 89 words of commentary to explain what that statement means. He doesn't just say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and then he drops it. No, he explains in very clear detail what, what he expects out of us and what he doesn't expect out of us, what to do and what not to do on that day. But when you go to the seventh commandment, it's just five words, and three of them are thou shalt not. Okay? Now, why doesn't God give any commentary on that one? You know, there's books written on that, right? And God doesn't give any commentary on it. You know, you know why God didn't give any commentary on that? I don't know either. Okay, here's my best guess. Here's my best guess. Committing adultery is something that we just instinctively know is wrong. So why does God have to spend three more paragraphs explaining why? You know, I had a guy tell me one time that before he was saved, he was out messing around with his wife incessantly for 20, 30 years. And he said to me, he said, you know, he said, uh, you don't understand, though. He said, I was walking in darkness when I did that. That was before I knew Christ. And I remember thinking to myself, I bet he really thinks God falls for that lie. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that even the heathen in Africa that knows God has God's laws written on his heart and on his conscience. And when you step forward publicly and you identify someone as your spouse, as your partner for life, this person that I'm committed to living life with, there is instinctively something on the inside of you that you know that to breach that sexual covenant is a sin. And don't ever come into my office and tell me, well, that was before I, you know, yeah, it might have been before you were saved. And understand now that you're saved, you should have some additional revelation in your life. But even before you knew God, you knew that was wrong, didn't you? Because committing adultery is something we instinctively know is a sin. You know, uh, when God came down and gave this commandment, one of the reasons he didn't have to explain this is because he knew for a fact he knew that these people knew what he was talking about. He also knew for a fact that they were doing it, and he also knew that they knew that they were doing it and they shouldn't have been doing it. You know, (coughs) You know, it's mine here. This is, you know, adultery was a huge problem in the ancient world. You know, I, I got to thinking about this the other day in my office. I mean, I really got to wrestling this through. And you know, when God called Israel out of Egypt and through the land of Canaan into the promised land, I don't think sometimes we realize that all of their neighbors during that time would have been Canaanites. Okay? And the, 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 premier, the, pri, the premier religion of the Canaanite culture was Baal worship. And Baal, uh, the, the, whole, the whole concept of Baal worship in the land of Canaan, they, they employed thousands, and I mean thousands, of male and female prostitutes that worked in these temples. And this was all part of the process of coming in and having a common religious experience in that day and appeasing the angry gods and, you know, and then Baal primarily the god of sun, the god of fertility, the god that makes things reproduce and grow. And so this whole idea of committing adultery it not only wasn't frowned on back then, it was actually encouraged. And the thing I want you to really grasp here this morning is when Moses came out off that mountain and said, I just spoke to God, and I've got a whole new command for what a family's supposed to be like. It is one man, it is one woman, together joined at the hip for life, and you're to remain faithful to that person until the day that you die. You have to understand, folks, that was a totally new teaching. You know our God is a radical, cutting-edge God. You know that, don't you? So you do it. Let me say it again. The whole, the whole culture that surrounded them when they came out of Egypt and through Canaan, it all revolved around sexual immorality and perversion. And when God came down off that mountain and said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, this was a brand new idea to them. And understand, too, one of the other reasons, too, that they understood that when he said that was because it wasn't like he introduced that idea into their culture. Oh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, God. I'll make sure I not go there. They knew what they were doing, and they knew that what they were doing was wrong. You know, uh, when we start talking about certain sins, especially a neon sin like adultery, 
I think one of the things that's easy to do is to pinpoint that one sin and spend so much time on that one sin, we really forget the big picture of what God's really trying to say when he says something. I uh, had an interesting experience one time, and if you ever get into the ministry, uh, you'll have these experiences too. I was in another church. I was quite a bit younger man at the time. But I had somebody walk into my office one time and sat down, they started talking to me, and they told me that their marriage probably wasn't going to make it. And you know, at that yeah, that's just one of those moments as a pastor, you do the best you can. Here, let me pray for you, and, you know, God's with you on this journey, and I don't know what else to say, you know. And when this person got up and walked out of my office, I had an epiphany. I want to share that with you, okay? Uh, it dawned on me, you know, when I came out of Bible college, I really didn't know much about any of this kind of stuff. I mean, I was still pretty naive. And if somebody would have handed me a, you know, a book called 100 Reasons People Get a Divorce, I would have devoured the whole thing. But when this person walked out of my office that day, it dawned on me, you know, there's really only about three reasons that a person gets a divorce. There's really not a hundred. There might be four or five if you really want to get technical about it, but there's, it's closer to three than a hundred, so we're going to go with three this morning. Okay? And let me give you the first, this isn't my first one, but if I, could take, if I could take all three of them and boil them down into one, it would be this. The real reason, the only reason that a person gets divorced and they go their separate ways is because there's been a violation of trust on a core issue. Let me say that again. The number one reason that people get a divorce is because there's been a violation of trust on a core issue. And someone in this relationship has crossed a line, an improper line, and the other person has been hurt so bad that in their mind the only way to really fix this is to walk away. I look like this. So I continue on in faith. The most obvious reason, point number one, if you're taking notes here, number one, the most obvious reason that people get a divorce is because there's been a violation of trust in the bedroom. I want to tell you a true story here this morning. <clears throat> I would have been a pretty young man at the time. I'd been in the ministry about a year. And I had a buddy of mine who uh, made pretty good money. And this... Uh, and he called me one day, and he said, I just cleaned out my wardrobe, and he said, I'm getting rid of some stuff. He said, why don't you stop by? This is, this is not the jacket, but he said, he said, take this, 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 and this, and he handed me a pile of stuff. I said, thank you. And we went home, and I showed my wife, and we were all excited about these new clothes that I'd gotten, because, you know, you're a pastor in a little church, you know, you just, you know. And uh, I started going through the stuff, and in, in, in case you, you're wondering, whenever a guy gives you a new jacket, instinctively, I put it on, I see how it fits, and you start going through the pockets, right? And I started going through just to make sure he had, you know, make sure he hadn't left a credit card or anything in there. And, I, and there was about three or four pockets on this one side. I reached in, and I felt something there, and I pulled it out. There was a condom in there. This wasn't a pharmaceutical-grade condom. This is one of those weird things that you buy, like, at a novelty store. Now, I knew this guy real well. I knew he was married. I knew he had two kids. And I remember him telling me that after he had his second kid, he had himself fixed. And I looked at that, and my wife looked at it, and we looked at each other, threw it in the garbage, I took the jacket back off. Didn't even feel comfortable wearing it anymore. And several years later, when he was going through a divorce, I actually just kind of, the Lord kind of orchestrated this, I bumped into his kids, and I asked him, I said, are, are you okay with this? And they said, no, this absolutely stinks. But they said, just between me and you, we saw it coming. I didn't have the heart to tell them, yeah, I saw it coming too. Turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 7. I want to show you something here. Proverbs chapter 7. We're going to read through this one verse at a time here. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you and keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them to your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call to understanding your kinsmen. They will keep you from the adulteress and from the wayward wife. 
with her seductive words. Verse 6. At the window of my house, he says, I looked out through the lattice. You know what that means? That means people are watching you in your life, whether you realize it or not, you're not going to get away with this. Verse 7, he says, I saw among the simple, I noticed a young man, a youth, who had no sense. Why is that always easy to pick out, a young man who has no sense? You can see he's walking the wrong direction in life. Verse 8, he was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. Do you realize what he's telling you there is that this young man knew exactly what he was walking into? He went looking for this. His bumping into this woman was no accident. Verse 10. Then out, of the, out, uh, out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute with crafty intent. Now, do you know the way a woman dresses is a reflection of what's going on inside her heart? It's a reflection of her intentions. It's a reflection of what she's trying to communicate. Verse 11. She is loud and defiant. Her feet never stay home. She is now on the street. She's now in the square. At every corner she looks. You young men, let me tell you something. A woman that does not find any satisfaction in being home with her husband, her, her kids, or her family is a scary woman. Stay away from her. Number 13, she took a hold of him and kisses him, and with a brazen faith, face, she says to him. Now, what's interesting here is even though he's primarily acting as the predator in this relationship, do you realize that she initiated the physical contact? Young man, be aware of a woman that's too free to grab you and touch you. Okay? She says, verse 14, today I fulfilled my vows and I have food for my fellowship offerings at home. Just like a good Pharisee, I fulfilled my religious obligations. God's not going to hold this sin against us. Let's go for it. Verse 15, so I came out to meet you. She says, I looked for you and I found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. You realize what she's doing there? She's working on all of his natural senses to pull him in. Young men, again, I would say to you, beware of a woman that dresses too loud, that wears too much makeup or too much perfume. That's a signal. She's trying to pull you in. Verse 18, come let us drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money. He will not come back until the full moon. How many of you know that wasn't true? <laughs> you see the setup going on there? With, pers with persuasive words, she led him astray, and she seduced him with the smoothness of her talk. And all at once he follows her like an ox going to slaughter, like a deer stepping into the noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing that it will cost him his life. This guy didn't really see old Papa Bear coming home, did he? Now then, my son, listen to me and pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down and slain. Her slain are the mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death. 